Now 75, Brady, who tortured and murdered five children, is attempting to convince the tribunal he's sane so he can move from a secure psychiatric unit to prison. In an extraordinary court exchange, he claimed his killings were recreational compared to the deaths caused by what he called Tony Blair's war crimes. Well, our North England correspondent Kieran Jenkins is in Manchester where relatives of some of the victims watched a video link of the proceedings. So, Kieran, what more do you have? Well, the families watched from a private room here in Manchester. Ian Brady spoke via video link from a maximum security hospital some 40 miles away. And when he did finally speak this morning, breaking a 50-year enforced silence, he had an awful lot to say about his own sanity, about his alleged mistreatment by doctors, and, when pushed, about those murders he committed all those years ago. When Ian Brady's soft Scottish accent finally punctured a 50-year silence, it was to reel off a list of his achievements in jail. He's an acknowledged narcissist, and over four hours of questioning grew increasingly impatient. The tube through which he's force-fed flapped at his face as he repeatedly insisted he was not mentally ill. Who doesn't talk to themselves, he asked. And as a van with two white police cars escorting it swept through the archway of the castle, there was booing from a crowd which had gathered outside. He spoke only briefly of the gruesome murders he committed, five children killed in the 1960s. Crimes, he said, made him a petty criminal compared to some. Since 1985, he's been held at this maximum security hospital. Now the tribunal must decide if he's safe enough to leave for a normal prison where he's hinted he'll starve himself to death. His own QC asked him directly, would he kill himself in jail? He answered vaguely. In prison, you're a monkey in a cage being poked with a stick. You cannot make plans when you have no freedom of control. Dr Cameron Boyd, a member of the panel, asked if he'd starve himself to death. Brady said... Well, if I did, they can force-feed me anyway. If they force-fed me, I then have another plan in mind. Finally, a frustrated Dr Boyd asked bluntly, why do you want to go to jail? Brady replied... After 50 years, I've had enough. I'm not interested in continuing. This, what would you call it, half a century in captivity. On and on and on. Nothing's changed. I'm going down. For all his talk, Brady remains the man who buried four young victims out on these moors. A fifth has never been found. Today, he spoke with ease about himself, his own needs, his own complaints about captivity. But what he has never said is where that final body is hidden. The body of Keith Bennett, just 12 when Brady killed him. This afternoon, Brady justified all five murders as an existential experience. What we should have close with us. We're like this all the time. Terry Kilbride says he's sickened by the stage Brady's been given. His brother John was strangled by Brady when he was 12 years old. That's how he's always done things. He likes to be the media man. I'm in charge of everything and this, that and the other. Well, he's not in charge of me. And it's always me, 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 me with Ian Brady. It, all these years it's been like that. And still he shows no remorse. This serial killer who now presents himself as a victim, who revealed little of his plans for the future, nor the secrets of his past. Kieran Jenkins reporting, or well, joining me now from Manchester, is the solicitor David Kerwin, who acted on behalf of the family of Keith Bennett and who, in the course of his work, had meetings with Ian Brady at Ashworth High Security Hospital. David Kerwin, there's a, uh, an awful feeling that, that, that there's a sort of morbid theatre or spectacle going on and that in watching it and even commenting on it now, really, Ian Brady is, is pulling all the strings, playing us like a violin. Yes, in fact, I've dubbed this the Brady Show. Uh, that's what the cynics might well call it. And this is the culmination of his ambition, an ambition which I perceived in 2006 when I met with him uh, at, uh, at Ashworth. I remember one occasion during the meetings there, he was boasting that he got more hits on the media than Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who'd only got 38, and, in fact, Brady had got 144. 
and he's now won. He's centre stage of the show, the spotlight is upon him, and this must be absolutely galling for the families of his victims. Well, how do we best now deny him that place centre stage and deny him that control that he seems to have at the moment? Well, well, the problem is this is a democratic country uh, and he has the legal right, in fact, to air his grievance before the courts. And, you know, justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. And unfortunately, that's got to be in public. And that probably is another cruel blow uh, to the families. We can't deny him this, but it's a matter in the end for the judge to decide whether he's insane or just psychotic. So society, society, in a way, has got to prove itself better than Ian Brady, then? By, well, by, again. Society really has got to prove itself better than Ian Brady by, if necessary, you know, we, we have a duty to stop him killing himself. Well, uh, I, I'm not so sure that Brady intends to kill himself. Somebody who, in fact, um, administers his own feed in the mornings, I'm told, on occasion, isn't somebody who's being force-fed. And I hear this morning, blow it all, that he makes toast as well. Now, those aren't the, the actions and the behaviour of someone who's intending to kill themselves, not by a long chalk. Isn't the unpalatable truth that Ian Brady is right that we're ob obsessed with his crimes now as we were 50 years ago? Well, he's right. This has captured the attention um, uh, uh, of everybody in this country. It's the most heinous murder of the 20th century. But I think what really has upset people and, 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 and kept that uh, imagination alive is the whereabouts of Keith Bennett's body. And it's so sad for me, particularly as Winnie Johnson's solicitor, that I wasn't able to deliver that to her and give her that closure she required by a Christian burial of her son when, in fact, um, I, I met um, uh, Brady in 2006. That's so sad. Well, don't we owe it to um, Keith Bennett's mother, Winnie Johnson, then, to deny Ian Brady control in this one respect that we could reopen the search for her son's body? I think you're absolutely right. I've never given up hope. In 2006, I was convinced he knew where the body was. He told me that he did. I still believe that, that he, he does know, but I don't think he's going to reveal it. It's his only asset that he's got left. It's a morbid chess game. It's the only piece he's got left on the board, and if he surrenders it, it's checkmate. But if we, so if we refuse to, um, if we wait for him to reveal, which clearly he's not going to, he still has the power. Therefore, surely the authorities should take their own decision to reopen that search. Well, that's always open to the Greater Manchester Police, but they, they, they've got to have some clues, and at the moment, it, it's a needle in a haystack. Just remember something else as well. You know, Brady, by um, appealing in this way to go back into the prison system, he's redeciding his tariff. His tariff was three life sentences concurrent, and life means life. Now, it's judges that change tariffs, not prisoners. But that's, in effect, what, what Brady is going to be granted if, he, in fact, he moves back into the prison system. He'll be altering his own sentence tariff. David Cohen, thank you very much for joining us. John. Now, Russia's President Vladimir Putin has confirmed that the fugitive American security contractor Edward Snowden is in the transit area of a Moscow airport.